Can scientists explain all of the mysterious technology that was apparently used by our most ancient ancestors? No, they cannot. Can we explain that same technology in this video? No, we can't do it either. But we can at least have fun showing it to you and trying to solve the puzzles in the process of doing so. In November 2022, restoration work was carried out on the marble reliefs found on the north facade of the Duomo of Florence in Italy. In the process, original polychrome paint was found on a sculpture called Madonna and Child with Adoring Angels. That's quite a revelation when you consider that the sculpture was created in 1359. Prior to the restoration work, it was thought that the sculptures had no paint on them at all. While the Duomo is famous around the world for its colorful marble cladding, it was thought that the whiteness of the figures was the natural exposed marble itself. Instead, the whiteness was a buildup of the dust and debris of centuries, on top of rich damask patterns, blue-green irises, red mantle, and more. This is the largest section of polychrome paint on any of the Duomo's external surfaces. It's now thought to be possible, perhaps even likely, that the other seemingly white sculptures on the Duomo may be hiding vibrant polychrome colors. The quality and intricacy of the work are incredible for something that's over 650 years old. Did the Aztecs fashion a calendar out of nothing but the sun and the mountains around them? It sounds unlikely, but that's a new theory which has been posited by a team of historians and experts in December 2022. They say that the accuracy and complexity of the Aztec farming calendar necessitates an ability to track the sun accurately, and that the mountains were the most obvious way to do it. When the Spanish arrived in Mexico in 1519, they took time out from butchering the locals for long enough to marvel at how the Aztec agricultural system managed to feed and sustain a population of around 3 million in and around what's now Mexico City. At the time, the largest population center in Spain was Seville, which was home to only around 50,000. One poor harvest or poorly planned season would have led to a famine in Mexico City, then known as the Basin, but it never happened. They even managed to adjust for leap year fluctuations. The most likely explanation is that they treated the Basin as a solar observatory and measured the distance between the sunrise and the peaks of the Sierra Nevada Mountains, always conducting their surveys from the same spot. The list of things we know about Machu Picchu in Peru is probably shorter than the list of things we don't know about it. Take, for example, the Temple of the Three Windows in the Sacred Plaza in Machu Picchu's main urban section. This lithic structure is made of three walls, the longest of which contains three large windows facing east. Nobody knows why the windows were included in the design or what purpose they serve. There are many theories, but a lot of them come from Spanish conquistadors and so ought to be viewed with a pinch of salt. Native historian Hiram Bingham believes the windows symbolize the place that the Inca believed they came from, which is based on the writings of Pachacuti Yanqui Sacamayahua. The chronicler wrote that Manco Capac, the first Inca ruler, ordered a mighty walled temple with three windows to be built in tribute to the windows of his parents' home. Inca mythology states that Manco Capac came from heaven, so the home of his parents would have existed on the spiritual plane. While it's easy to write the windows off as nothing more than windows, the fact that there are three of them facing in the same direction indicates a significance that we're unaware of. We're now moving on to China. Specifically, we're going to the Yangshan Quarry on the side of Yanmen Shan Mountain near Nanjing. It's thought that quarrying activity has been happening at this site since the days of the Six Dynasties, some 1,800 years ago. In 1405, Emperor Zhu Yangshang ordered the creation of a giant stela for his Ming Qiaoling Mausoleum and decreed that the required rock should be quarried from Yangshan. Somehow, his workers misinterpreted his request. Instead of the 20-foot-tall stela that he wanted, they started to quarry what would have been eight times taller and weighed 31,000 tons. For comparison, the largest monolith in the ancient world is Russia's 1,250-ton thunderstone. Was this a simple mistake, though, or something more? 
There are several sections of carved rock at the site that seem to indicate that it wasn't just a simple quarry. Smooth round shapes have been cut out of the rocks in places that would serve no purpose if the blocks were to be moved or used in construction, and patterns have been carved into the walls of the spaces below the carved rocks. What was this site really, and why has it been elaborately carved in such a way? Is crystal healing a misunderstood science, or, as the Brits might call it, a load of old cobblers? Plenty of people believe it to be the latter, but it's been around for a very long time. There's a reference to crystal-based healing in Plato's account of Atlantis. According to Plato, the Atlanteans used crystal-based technology to transmit thoughts to each other and also to read minds. The oldest historical documentation of crystal healing or crystal-based technology is even older than that. The ancient Sumerians used crystals in their magical formulas, devised some 6,500 years ago. A few thousand years after that, the ancient Egyptians used crystals as health aids and buried lapis lazuli scarabs with the deceased in the belief that the stones would protect the dead in the afterlife. The ancient Greeks wore amethysts during and after drinking wine in the belief that they would ease hangovers or even prevent them completely. Even now, the Hopi Native Americans of Arizona diagnose illnesses among their people with the aid of crystals. Has our modern culture taught itself to sneer at a form of technology that our ancient ancestors understood far better than we do? There are two names for our next exhibit, the Lahoon Mathematical Papyri and the Kahoon Mathematical Papyri. It's an ancient Egyptian manuscript and is a small part of the larger Cahoon papyri, which was found by Flinders Petri at El Lahoon in the late 19th century. The location of the discovery is thought to have once been a worker's town, built for the people who built the Pyramid of Sesotris II 3,900 years ago. The papyri contain fascinating medical texts, administrative texts, and texts that provide insight into the social lives of the people of the era. But the six fragments of mathematical text provoke more intrigue than any other. Their approximations of the mathematical content of the rind papyrus. As such, the text is divided into sections, with the first section dealing with arithmetic and algebra, and the second section dealing with geometry. The contents of the two sections are entirely correct and remarkably sophisticated. If this was taught to Egyptian children, they would have had a greater knowledge of mathematics than children at most schools in the developed world today, including multiplication tables that go far higher than those generally taught to present-day school children. Officially, the atom was discovered by John Dalton in the year 1800. However, there was a man who lived around 2,450 years ago who would have been entirely unimpressed by the discovery, as he'd predicted it during his own lifetime. His name was Democritus, and he was a Greek philosopher. He even came up with the word atom. Democritus was a determinist who believed that the world was entirely made of atoms and subject to the laws of physics, thus negating the possibility of free will. His reasoning was simple. If a person can cut something in two and then the two halves can be cut into again, then it must be possible to continue this process infinitely, even if the halves become too small for human hands to cut, or even for human eyes to see. However, Democritus reasoned that the universe must have a foundation, because nothing can be made of nothing, so there must be a base unit from which all other things are made. That base unit in the mind of the philosopher was the atom. The word comes from the Greek term for uncuttable, although that was proven not to be the case in the 20th century. Here's one of the strangest theories you're ever likely to hear on our channel. There are some people who believe that up to half a million people in India were killed by a nuclear explosion that happened 12,000 years ago. Some people even think they found a crater from the explosion in the desert close to Jodhpur. Proponents of the idea point to passages in ancient Sanskrit epics like the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, which were written 2,900 years ago and detail a war between Rama and a demon called Ravana. Both texts contain passages that, when translated into English, speak of a projectile weapon powered with all the energy in the universe that created a flash as bright as 10,000 suns and then a column of smoke. After it exploded, the birds turned white, 
pottery broke without any obvious cause, and the hair and nails of survivors turned white. That certainly does sound like a nuclear blast, but we should bear in mind that the same texts speak of people taking to the sky in vehicles powered by fire. Perhaps the science fiction writers who lived in India 2,900 years ago were the greatest of all time. While it might be possible to argue about whether nuclear weapons might have existed 2,900 years ago, no such argument can be had about gilding. Our ancient ancestors were far better at gilding than we are, and that's a fact. Even criminals were more skilled at it than our best modern-day experts. Evidence of this can be seen in literally thousands of gold-gilded items discovered in Egypt, Turkey, Israel, Iran, and across Europe. If we wanted to go about the task of gilding today, we'd use electroplating technology. That wasn't an option until the 19th century. For tens of centuries prior to that, our ancestors used a thin layer of mercury as a binding agent, resulting in a better, cleaner finish. We'd never use such a method today because working with mercury is believed to be too dangerous. But people were obviously doing it on an industrial scale 2,000 years ago. Criminals often used gilding as a way of decorating a bronze, wooden, or stone item with a layer of gold, and then selling it for a high price on the pretense it was made from solid gold. We suspect a lot of people lost a lot of money that way. You might have to suspend your disbelief for a moment when we discuss this next artifact, but bear with us because it's a story worth hearing. This carved stone is the so-called Roswell Rock, so named because it was found in 2004, a little over 20 miles away from the site of the alleged UFO crash landing of 1947. It's now generally accepted that the Roswell UFO incident was a well-executed hoax, but the existence of this rock can't be explained away as easily as faked video footage. The stone has interesting magnetic properties. When a magnet is placed over its thick end, it spins clockwise. But it spins anti-clockwise if a magnet is held above the thinner end. The moon symbols on its surface are also thought to be significant, as they're almost identical to symbols that have appeared in crop circles all over North America. Scientists and archaeologists are positive that it's a hoax, but they're struggling to identify any marks on its surface from any tool or machine used in its manufacture. Not even one single abrasion can be found, even when the artifact is examined under a microscope. A hoax is still the most likely explanation, but the mystery of how it was made persists. Iran isn't exactly short of beautiful old buildings, but few can match the beauty of Ali Kapu. It was built during the Persian Empire's Safavid era of the early 1600s in Naqsh-e-Yahan Square, Isfahan, on the orders of Shah Abbas I. The most remarkable room inside the palace is the Music Hall, which is where the king would entertain guests and host his royal parties and receptions. Both scientists and architects alike consider it to be a work of acoustic genius. The double walls, with their various niches carved in vase-like shapes, are designed to absorb echoes and effectively create a quadraphonic sound system centuries before the same effect could be created through electric power transmission. If you were to stand in the middle of the room and clap, you wouldn't hear an echo, despite the chamber's vast size. This incredibly clever design meant that all of the king's party guests could hear every note that his live musicians played on their setars and kamanex without distortion. The niches act as sound diffusers. It's a sound engineering masterpiece from 400 years ago. The Inca site of Tipon is stunningly beautiful. In fact, it's so beautiful that you might be inclined just to stand back and admire it rather than thinking about how it was made. We're inviting you to think about that right now, though because science has never been able to tell us who could have taught the Inca how to design and create an artificially irrigated garden. That's what Tipa is. It might look like a gorgeous monument, but it has a practical purpose. Some historians, including Peruvian Dr. Luis Antonio Pardo, think it may not be an Inca creation at all. He feels it might have been left behind by an even older, forgotten civilization. And the Inca simply found it and made use of it. Because of the stepped nature of Tipan and the many different wet and dry levels it includes, it's thought that this was a large-scale agricultural laboratory. 
Using Tipon, the Inca could determine which kind of crops could grow in different types of environments and use that information to inform their crop plantation strategy elsewhere. Creating it required some seriously advanced knowledge of hydraulics, though, and we have no idea where it could have come from. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching, and see you soon.